It has been a privilege to have an annual lectureship, Christian Ethics. And we're going to say some more in just a moment about those whose generosity has made it possible and to talk a bit about the Curry and the Strickland behind the Curry Strickland Distinguished Lectures in Christian Ethics. But it has been a real privilege and joy to be a part of this. And we're glad to welcome you here today. And we pray that God's blessings upon each of you and upon our time here together. We're going to welcome our distinguished guests and lecturers here in a, in a bit. But we're going to begin at this time going to ask our president, Howard Payne University, Dr. Bill Ellis, to come and bring his welcome. Dr. Ellis. You know, there are certain events that are part of a university that are your centerpieces. You know what I mean? The things which in some way embody uh, the heart and the soul of, uh, of an institution. It's the same thing in churches. There are certain events that occur uh, at a church that you look forward to. Sometimes it's a potluck dinner, you know, that happens every year. Uh, that is the place that, while well, you might not point to that as the thing which embodies what the church is, you, you would be lessened if it weren't that way. And I want you to know that the Curry Strickland Lecture is that for us here. We certainly have many things during our academic year that are centerpieces for us and important events. But I dare say there is not another event such as this lectureship that embodies so many pieces of what we are as a university. As a Christian institution, this lectureship centered in, uh, in the, the things of the kingdom and the things of the Lord. And I would even go so far as to say being the kind of lectureship it is, we operate not within the mainstream, but on those fringes where the Lord himself operated. Following Christ, uh, we tend to follow him in social ways too much. And, uh, but when you have a lectureship that is focused on, uh, on ethics, and the kinds of things that Dr. Tracy was interested in and wrote about, you're on the fringes. You're pushing things uh, in ways that the Lord pushed them. So I point to this lectureship as a centerpiece in that way of the institution as a Christian institution. And certainly in our, our centering in uh, Dr. Tracy and uh, the, those who've gone before, we're talking about academicians. This is a scholarly lectureship. It talks about things that are so closely tied to academics, which is, of course, what we are as an academic institution. And the other thing is, all the friends come back. It's about family as well. We, uh, we have lecturers come in. We have uh, opportunities to have scholars into the campus, but um, most of those are not family, if you understand what I mean, you know. But so much of the Curry Strickland lectureship is about family, about coming back together as a community, as part of the kingdom of God, as a part of this institution. And every year we have an opportunity to add to the family with new folks who come and are a part of this lectureship and are then a part of our university part of the Curry Strickland lectureship, uh, part of the family. And so it is with, uh, with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to, come, to be a, come and be a part of this very important moment uh, in the life of our institution this year. We are delighted to have you on the campus. We hope you feel at home. My, my desire is that you feel at home, and if you don't feel at home, then I'm hoping it's your fault and not ours, because our intention is to make you feel a part of the family. This is a great, great day, wonderful afternoon, and I know we've all been looking forward to it. So without further ado, that's my welcome. Uh, let's, um, let's sit back and enjoy just some wonderful, stimulating discussion through this afternoon. Donnie, thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Ellis. It's good to see all of you here. Glad you've come. Uh, Dr. Ellis was talking about this matter of uh, coming back and being together again. Uh, every time we do this, I, I chuckle a little bit to myself. Uh, I've been teaching school like this for 26 years. And so I'm reminded that, you know, you work with students all the time and they look very much like students. And if you don't know what I mean by that, hang around and watch, watch the back a little bit. Some of them are gonna pass in and out at various times. They're not gonna pass out, I hope, but I mean, they're gonna come in and out. But, uh, you know, they're students and they look like students and they act like students and each year they're different and each year they're the same. And I think, you know, these people are going to grow up someday and become responsible people. And then I remember that, you know, when I was a student here, so was my colleague Bill Fowler. So was my colleague Mary Carpenter. And so was our friend and one for whom these lectures have been dedicated and given and supported, David Curry. Uh, and I think about that. And then I think about Gary Elliston who through the generosity of he and his wife Molly makes this whole thing possible through their gift. We were all were students together and you know, we looked very much like students then and I think, you know, we knuckleheads grew up to be real people and, and uh, so, so these guys will too. So it gives me some hope and some encouragement but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I got tickled, the, the connections uh, part of this thing, we always smile when you think about it. We were having lunch and Mary Carpenter was telling the story that that one year during the Christmas break, uh, she and, and Rick Akins, uh, who's on our board of trustees, and, and uh, uh, Gary Elliston, uh, the three of them went to Washington, D.C. to a Christian Life Commission meeting. So all the way back in those days, and I remember that uh, we were in the Ministerial Alliance, a group that will meet with our lecturers tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. And the first time I have ever met Phil Strickland, uh, I was a student officer in that organization. We invited him to come and speak to our Ministerial Alliance, and he came and he spoke, and David Curry and I took him out to dinner afterwards. Uh, I, every time I think of that, I smile because he talked to us about world hunger, something that was very dear to his heart. It's also continued to be something that's important and we, th we talk about how we respond to the world. You will notice if you look at the biographical information on some of these people that they've been very much involved in these kinds of things. And as a matter of fact, today we have a display at the back of the room uh, here in Brownwood, Texas today. We're having an annual fundraising event to help feed hungry people in our area. Uh, it's called Empty Bowls. And it takes taking place at the uh, Brownwood Coliseum, started at 11 p.m., runs through 7 this evening. We finish here this afternoon at 5 o'clock. And you want to have dinner before you travel or go home, go by the Coliseum. For $10, you get a bowl of soup. You get to keep your bowl, and the soup's been donated. And so $9 will go to help feed hungry people in Brownwood. $1 will be sent to feed the Hungry National Organization. And you say, what are you doing promoting something like that at a lecture? But it's a lecture on Christian ethics. I think Phil Strickland and David Curry be quite happy for us to do that. Besides all that, my colleague Gary Graham will be very happy I did that. And I have to live with him every day. So you know how that is. <laughs> no, it's a great thing. It's a great thing. This is a wonderful opportunity we have. Uh, the name David Curry means a lot at Howard Payne University. It means a lot to Texas Baptists. It means a lot to Southern Baptists. Uh, having known David since our school days, I will tell you, sometimes it means different things to different people. Uh, those of you that know him best can, can chuckle about that. But he has been extremely influential, and it's, it's one of those kinds of things that uh, his passion his concern uh, for things, for ethical issues, he had some of that fire in him all the way back to those students' days. And so we're so pleased that he's here today. 
he and, and, and his wife, his sister and brother-in-law, going to ask him to come in just a moment and, and say a few words to you. So although he's worn very many different hats, and David is one of those people who can wear different hats and wear them effectively, he's the president of Cornerstone Builders, a man who loves and cares about Baptist in a way that few I've ever known, maybe few ever have. Dr. David Curry, come and say a few words to us this afternoon. Welcome, David Curry. Thank, thank you, Donnie. Donnie, I nearly missed my introduction, it appears. Uh, my wife's father, they think, had a stroke, and so she just took off to head back to San Angelo. Uh, but this is, uh, uh, I do want to welcome you. Uh, I want to thank Gary and Molly, who aren't here, for doing this uh, in honor of Phil and I. Uh, the three of us were very close. Um, <clears throat> Phil and I were extremely close, to say the least. Uh, we hunted together. Uh, he read everything I wrote, including the things I wrote late at night that he would write back and say, you know you can't publish that. And I said, I know, but I needed to get it off my chest so you could tell me I couldn't publish it. <clears throat> and I will clean it up now. And I miss him every day. Uh, it is a little sad occasion for us in that uh, my mother, who tried to attend these each year, uh, passed away on December the 20th. Uh, but a wonderful life of 94 years and eight months, and I had the honor of preaching her funeral. Uh, my points were <clears throat> faith, friends, fun, fun friends, family, and faith. Uh, because she was a great deal of fun. She continued to make friends. The whole little church at Paint Rock was full, along with folks standing and folks in the choir loft. And at 94, you usually outlive your friends. But she just kept making new ones. Uh, certainly loved her family uh, unconditionally, um, which was pretty important to me because I need that kind, uh, or I don't get any, uh, <laughs> for sure. And, but I am thrilled that my sister and brother-in-law are here, and I'm thrilled that uh, Carolyn is here, and that our families are able to stay close. Um, her girls uh, are my girls, and my sons are her sons, in my opinion, and uh, <clears throat> that's very special to me. And I'm especially grateful for Stephen and Susie and Welton being our speakers. Uh, Stephen is carrying on in the Phil Strickland tradition of giving his life to Baptist, at considerable financial sacrifice for what he could do as a lawyer in the public sector. Susie, no one was a better choice to succeed Phil at the Christian Life Commission than Susie Painter, uh, both in her heart and her intelligence and her commitment. Uh, she is a perfect fit. And Welton and I go back a long, long way, 35 years at least, a remarkable man, head of the Interfaith Alliance, on whose board I continue to proudly serve in Washington, D.C., making such a significant contribution to the dialogue uh, regarding religious liberty, <clears throat> and that just because we disagree doesn't make the other the enemy. And no one says it better than Welton, no one brings that perspective on a national stage with more balance and more integrity and more uh, Christ-centeredness uh, that he has while he works with the Muslims and the Sikhs and the Buddhists and the others that we share the board with, and they're really quite interesting people. They put up with me. I told them one time, you know, the reason I do this is so I can tell y'all y'all to believe in Jesus. And they just, they handle it just fine. Uh, my closest friend on the board is a Jewish rabbi. Loretta and I have been in his home for the Passover meal one Friday evening, which is without doubt one of the highlight religious experiences of my life. And so it has helped me grow a great deal for a, for a guy from Paint Rock with a high school graduating class of five uh, to be friends with uh, these folks is uh, uh, really a tremendous honor. So I thank you for being here. I thank this university. Um, I rotated off the board, but Dr. Ellis has done a remarkable job since he's been here, Bill. I'm extremely proud of you and the way the, the school has grown and um, and the commitment to its Christian commitment and integrity and Baptist principles. Uh, this is the one school I don't worry about uh, not really staying true to what it means to be a Baptist. 
And part of that's Donnie, who I went to school with as well, and, and I'm so proud of him. And we've deer hunted together, too, years ago. We ought to do that again, Donnie. You, you're welcome to come. But I thank you all for being here. I thank you for, for this group of folks that have taken out of their time because it was significant to them. And I think you will hear things um, that will challenge you in your living of your Christian life. And so thank you so much. David, what's your father-in-law's name? Jack Whitehead. Would you join me and let's pray? Heavenly Father, we pause in the midst of the moment to seek your blessing, seek your intervention, and ask for your provision and care over David's father-in-law, Jack, be with his wife Loretta even as she travels. Give her mercy to bring her safely there. Give her a kind of peace in the midst of the anxiety that this brings. To know that you'll walk with her. That you'll hold her hand. Be with David as he's here with us and yet part of him goes with her and with his father-in-law. Use doctors and nurses as instruments in your hand. Minister to him. Minister to his beloved ones. And minister to each of us. Now walk with us as we continue this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When you talk about speaking on behalf of Christian emphases, Christian values in the political arena, particularly in the political arena in Texas, the name Phil Strickland is just the name that's on that role that you call of people who've impacted. And I may be a little bit like Bum Phillips, the old football coach, when they asked him if Earl Campbell, the running back, was in a class by himself, he said, well, I, I don't know if he's in a class by himself, but it doesn't take long to call the role. <laughs> and when we talk about the people who really helped us understand and show us the way to be Christian and try to make a difference in the political arena. The name Phil Strickland is on that very short roll. And it is our blessed privilege today to have his wife, widow Carolyn Strickland, to come and, and uh, say a word to you. Uh, Texas Baptist offering for world hunger. Empty bowls mean something to her. I told you that's what Phil Strickland talked about the first time we saw him here. And to have coming to bring these lectures those who do the kind of work that Phil loved and did so well and those who continue to do that, it, it means the world. And so, Carolyn Strickland, we're so glad to see you. Would you come and say a word? You, you don't have to come. You want to say it from there? You may say it from there. Yes, you may. I just want to say thank you. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to all of the students and all of the professors that are here today uh, to hear these wonderful speakers. And I want, as they challenge you today, for you to challenge them tomorrow as they come into your classrooms. That's what this is about, and that's what... Uh, it's a great thing, and you've got three of them here, and I want them to say and talk to me. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Thank you. David made reference to it. Uh, we certainly would not be here today doing what we are doing if it were not for God's blessing upon the life of Gary and Molly Elliston. And we certainly wouldn't be here, not only if it were not for God's blessing, but for their willingness to share God's blessings. 
and endow this scholarship, or I'm sorry, endow this lecture series and make it possible for us to have these lectures each year. Uh, Gary Elliston is a name extremely well known in, in legal circles. We could tell you about uh, being named about the most important lawyers in Dallas and so on. Uh, we could talk to you long. You can see some basic biographical information about him there on your program. Uh, a graduate of Howard Payne, he and David became friends maybe the first day they were on campus together and they've continued to be lifelong friends. I never tire of hearing David talk about his friends. Uh, he talks about Gary Ellison sometimes and I've heard him say, you know, Gary was always the guy that was out there doing good things, doing the right things. Maybe he sometimes would like to have been a little bit more on the edge, but that's not his personality. So he did that vicariously through David. And so that's, that's David's testimony. It's fun, and if you knew the two guys you went to school with, it makes a heap of sense. But uh, Gary and Molly Elliston are such good friends to this university, and, and he has served this university not only as a distinguished alumnus and as a recipient of an honorary doctorate from, the, from our school, he also served on, on our academy's board of directors Academy of Freedom, he served as a trustee, chaired our board of trustees, and just did a phenomenal job. And if I'm not, uh, I may be a little bit behind on his resume. He was on the board of regents at Baylor. I'm not, he still is, he still is. So this is a man who makes a difference. Um, teaches a Sunday school class. And he's the kind of Sunday school teacher that occasionally calls people like me and says, now, I've been studying such and such and help me with this bit. And so, God bless Gary and Molly today. Sorry that they're not here with us, but we certainly thank the Lord for them. We're going to begin this afternoon uh, with the topic, A Christian Voice in a Public Arena. Stephen Reeves, Legislative Counsel of the Christian Life Commission of the Baptist General Convention of Texas. Uh, he works on behalf of Texas Baptist, helps speak to Texas Baptist, helps speak to others on behalf of issues in which we attempt to talk about how faith is meaningful in the experiences of life. Uh, he works out of the uh, Christianity and Public Policy Office there in Austin. Uh, he, that's a comfortable place for him, Austin. He has uh, roots and ties there. Uh, he does a lot of work in, in helping advocate on behalf of moral and public policy uh, issues in the Texas legislature, helps to educate churches about current policy issues, and encourages Texas Baptist about to get involved in the political process, keep abreast of developments in church and state law. He also works to provide churches with some basic legal advice through a reference manual called Keeping Your Church Out of Court. And you students say, well, that's very, very nice. I don't know when that would ever be meaningful to me. So he walked in today and he said, you know, we eating lunch there right before we came over. And he said, I was just on the phone with the youth minister and I told him where I was going, what I was doing. And he said, oh, yeah, that's, I'm a graduate of that. John Adams. It has been a very few years ago that John Adams sit, sat where you guys are sitting today. He's now a youth minister in South Texas, and he's calling Stephen about talking about this matter of how you deal with the legal issues. So it's as relevant as every student in the room and as relevant as every one of us in the room who care about such things. And so we're extremely grateful for the work that he does and although we're only a small part, and we can no more speak for the whole as anyone else, nevertheless, may we assume a bitter prerogative and say, as a part of the Texas Baptist family, thank you, Stephen Reeves, for what you do, and we hear you gladly as you come to speak to us. Welcome, Stephen Reeves. Good afternoon. Thank you all very much for that. Warm welcome, and Dr. Robinshine, thank you very much for that introduction. It's 
It's great to be with you. I really thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, uh, and to be on the same program as Susie and Dr. Gaddy uh, is, is a real honor. Uh, and I'm really grateful at this point that you let me go first. I don't, I'm glad I don't have to follow either one of them, so I appreciate that. I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say. The Curry Strickland Distinguished Lectures in Christian Ethics. That's quite a name. <laughs> Uh, for starters, I've never been distinguished before, so that's kind of cool. I appreciate that. I feel pretty honored. Um, but Curry and Strickland, as you've always, already heard, are, are two big names in my world. I want to say thank you to David um, for all he's done for Texas Baptist throughout the years. And he's always been a strong encourager to me, ready with words of affirmation and support whenever we've seen each other at Baptist gatherings. So thank you very much. And uh, as you see, I'm, I'm wearing appropriate manly footwear in your honor. I know that that's important to you. And so I want to do that and make sure you noticed. Um, and Phil Strickland, really a giant in my mind. Um, other than Susie Painter, there's no one more responsible for my career path than Phil. And I'll always be in debt to him. Uh, I was f so fortunate to know F Phil for a brief few years. As a young law school grad, knowing that I didn't fit the traditional law school and law firm mold or path, uh, it was Phil, who was an attorney as well, that uh, showed me a different way. Uh, one of my most fortunate blessings in life was to work with Phil at the Capitol during the uh, spring of 2004, during a special session of the legislature, uh, when uh, our governor, same governor, of course, uh, and others had decided that casinos were really the best way to fund our public education system. Uh, at that time, that's, that's what he decided. Um, racinos, slot machines at the racetracks. And uh, walking those halls with Phil and Weston Ware uh, was really a life-changing experience. Um, we worked together directly for less than a year, but it was enough time uh, for him to take me to the Nighthawk restaurant in, in Austin like he liked to do, and enough time to get me hooked on this type of unique work that we do at the CLC. And I'll come back to Phil in a few minutes because I want to tell a story, a uh, favorite story of our time together. The title I was given to speak to this afternoon was A Christian Voice in the Public Arena. And that's, that's a pretty broad topic. But before I get into the meat of what I have to say, a, a bit of a caveat here in, in the university. I'm, I'm, I'm not a preacher, not a theologian that didn't go to seminary, and I'm also not a professor, uh, no PhD here. Um, but what I'll try to share with you is from a practitioner's perspective. Uh, in my role at the CLC, I stand there, and on the, on the one hand, I'm in Austin, and advocating and as a registered lobbyist at the Capitol uh, on behalf of the Christian Life Commission. And on the other hand, I'm turning back to Texas Baptists and to churches and trying to explain a little bit of what's going on and what's important and uh, what they should be paying attention to and then try and facilitate uh, that relationship and encourage folks to be involved and to have their voice heard at the Capitol. And in that role, I'm asked to speak publicly a lot, uh, committee hearings, city council meetings, student groups. I had a Howard Payne class here just a few weeks ago who came to the Capitol. Um, church groups. I give lots of talks. I don't give a lot of lectures. So this is, I realize there's a big difference between the two, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best here. And what I lack in formal education, however, uh, I like to think I make up for in real life lessons and, and some intense in-depth experiences. I want to say thank you to those who've uh, been so influential in my career and also my faith. First, my mom who made the trip here, and um, so that's important. Um, I've also been fortunate to be a member of some great churches, great Texas Baptist churches, uh, including Pond Springs Baptist Church that I grew up in, a little, little church in Northwest Austin. And uh, I've heard some mighty powerful prophetic preaching in my time. Uh, first and foremost from Roger Painter, who's here today, my pastor, but also from Charlie Johnson and Philip Wise and Jim Somerville in Washington, D.C. and Steve Hyde in Northern Virginia. Um, I've been fortunate to have such, such great pastors. 
And professionally, I've, been men I've mentioned Phil and Susie uh, already, but also Brent Walker and Holly Holman at the Baptist Joint Committee, and James Dunn and Melissa Rogers. And, and in my book, those are some pretty good mentors. That's, that's a, that's a real-life education I can take if those are my professors, so I'm very in, in debt to them. And if there's a central theme for my lecture here today, it's this, that I believe that Christians here in the U.S. have a responsibility as a, as a people of faith called to work for justice and as American citizens given the power to self-govern, they have a responsibility to engage the public square in the realm of politics the responsibility to work from justice for justice comes clearly from scripture and the opportunity to do so on a large scale comes from the american system of government the democracy where we all have a say and the two together create this obligation in my mind but it is a road fraught with pitfalls and dangers uh, and how christians speak in that public square in my opinion is just as important as what they say and what they decide to speak out on. And it should go without saying, but when Christians enter the public square, the public sphere, they should act like Christians. People should be able to recognize that in them. And I'm afraid that's hard to do sometimes, especially these days. And as I outline what I consider some important rules for this involvement, Realize that um, I fall short of this plenty of times. That uh, I do what what I know not what I should not do. Uh, but I also firmly believe that the the work we do at the Christian Life Commission is a pretty good model for how this interaction should work and could work uh, successfully with with some real changes and improvements in public policy for the people of Texas. And I'm going to talk about that, but I promise not to turn this into just one long commercial for the Christian Life Commission. But I want to turn now to a story about Phil, because not only because I think it gives you a little bit of insight into the type of man he was, but also I think it illustrates some, some points I want to, I'm, that I want to make generally about this relationship. As I said earlier, in the, in the special session of the spring of 2004, I was working in Austin with Phil as a legislative consultant, having just graduated from law school and taking the bar. And there was a strong push for slot machines in Texas. Phil asked me to do a very simple task. Uh, I didn't have a lot of, of uh, experience, uh, but this really wasn't a lobby visit he asked me to go on. It was more like an errand. It was you know, kind of a glorified errand when you go to the Capitol. Um, he asked me to, to go to a legislator's off office who will remain nameless uh, who was a friend on this issue. He also opposed the expansion of, of gambling. And I was to pick up a name of, a list of names of legislators. Uh, and I can't remember if, um, if this was a name of folks we needed to work on, movable members who weren't sure where they stood yet, or maybe it was the hard yeses who, who were opposed us on this issue, who, who supported the gambling expansion, or maybe it was the, the hard no's, those that were with us. It was, it was, uh, it's, you, you do a lot of counting when, you, when you're a, a, a lobbyist, uh, and numbers make a big difference. And so uh, this, this list was important. And um, so I went over there to, uh, to pick up this list, and I walk in, and there's the young legislative aide at the desk, and I tell her who I'm with and, and what I'm here to do, and, and she says, okay, sure, I, you can have that list, but um, I'm going to keep the hard copy you know, I don't know what it was. She didn't, didn't want to hand it over to me or what. But she said, but why don't you just, just write them down on your pad? And I said, okay, I'll do that. So I sit down and, and start writing, them, writing the, the list. And she says, you know, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I've got a question, and I think you're, uh, you're a good person to ask. She then pointed to one of what I noticed were several Bibles on her desk and in the, her work area. And she asked, where in that book does it say we should provide a free public education? And I kind of was taken aback and thought about it for a second. And I said, well, it doesn't say that in there. It says it in the Texas Constitution. And, um, but I'm pretty sure that it does say something about caring for the poor and providing a public education is a pretty good place to start. Um, 
needless to say, she did not like that answer very much at all, and the visit kind of went downhill from there. Uh, see, working for the Christian Life Commission, you have to learn the art of a legislative visit, uh, and in particular, how to talk to any office, no matter how differently they believe from you. Uh, you engaging and befriending people with vastly different beliefs than yours, all the while maintaining your own integrity. It's, it's tricky business to do this. And I had not learned that lesson yet. Um, so after about a half hour of intense debate, when I remember her saying things like, do you think those people want an education? Um, I'd finished writing the list and she said, you know, on second thought, I don't think I want you to have that list after all. Um, okay, you want me to tear off my paper and give it back to you? She said, yes. Okay, so I did that and hightailed it out of there in, in a hurry. Um, and went back to the office to explain to Phil and apologize to Phil as to how I failed at this very simple errand. Um, I went in and we, we sat down at this little kitchen table and I explained to him what happened and told him how sorry I was. And he just sat there nodding his head, kind of in this little bit, he kind of, you know, this little nod, kind of like, okay, I got it. I know what you're saying. Keep going. I understand. And when I finished, he wasn't angry at all. He was uh, very kind and told me not to worry about it. And then he took my legal pad and he took a pencil and he just barely <laughs> went over the surface of the impressions that I had written on the paper above it. And we got about every single name we needed off of there. <laughs> That's the kind of shrewd smarts that, uh, that Phil had. A creative, keen and creative mind. He was, he was very kind and generous to me. Uh, but I also learned from that experience how to redirect conversation to areas of agreement um, and how to better pick my battles when I'll legislate to visit. The title of Christian Voice in the public square kind of assumes there should be one. Kind of assumes that we should be out there in the public square. And I think so, as I've already mentioned, but I realize that not everyone agrees with me on that, on that end. Uh, um, I think it's a fair question. There are those, um, a handful, that would say, just leave your faith, don't talk about it. Um, I don't care if that's your motivation. That's not the business to talk about in the public square. But then there are Christians that, that shun all secular and outside culture and would rather just build a bubble around their home and the church or university and keep all negative influence out, including secular politics. Personally, I think it's sure hard to be salt and light in the world if we shun it and refuse to participate. Others feel that politics is too dirty a business. It's beneath the church that Christians can engage without being corrupted or compromised. Um, believe me, I understand that uh, on a daily basis, it's not easy. Um, we should, that we should just take care of each other maybe and, and set a good example, but not enter that political arena. But I see two immediate problems with these views. First, if we follow that road, we abdicate our responsibility as citizens of the U.S. Um, there sure is a tension between, you know, citizens of two kingdoms. We have obligations to God and Caesar, and it's, it's, we've got to balance those. I just don't believe that you can shun one and abdicate your responsibility as a citizen. Second, if we don't work for justice through the political system, others will step in. They uh, might not share our convictions on issues, and they... Uh, might not share our standards of behavior. Um, but politics abhors a vacuum. If you're not sitting at the table, somebody else is going to take your seat. And so I think we have a duty to be there and to represent our faith well. Others feel like politics is just, just too controversial or somehow the separation of church and state dictates that we not talk about such things in church. And I think this view displays a very, very narrow reading of the gospel, first and foremost, and a misunderstanding of the meaning of separation of church and state. And I think you'd agree with me here today that there's no shortage of Christians 
talking and using faith in the political realm today. What I think we need are Christians who are willing to take the risks, engage in the political arena, and do so in a different way, and one that I think is rare and unfortunately not modeled too often in this culture. So if we can agree that Christians should engage, then I'd like to explore some of the following questions. Who should engage? Whose voice? Whose voices are we talking about? Who do they speak for? What do they say? What are, the, what are their strategies? What, what is the content? And finally, most importantly, uh, how do they speak? How do they behave? And before I address each one of those in turn, I'd like to make a few overall points. When I say the public sphere, the public square these days, I mean politics and the media. Now our debates don't happen on the courthouse square and are not confined to that big pink building in Austin. They happen 24 hours a day, seven days a week, on the cable news networks, on websites and blogs, and of course, Facebook. What a wonderful place for this kind of debate. Uh, it's my strong conviction that the realms of media and politics have very non-Christian and even anti-Christian motivations and goals that we need to be aware of and recognize when we step into those spheres. The media celebrate, and in my opinion, sometimes create dissension, disagreement, argument, conflict. These are not Christian values or goals. Uh, these are not reconciliation, peace, and redemption. For the networks, the bigger the controversy, the more the outrage, the more the viewers, and the more ad time they sell. They want guests with polar opposite views, duking it out at ever-increasing volume. They seem to hope that the truth, if they hope for the truth, is somehow a byproduct of these arguments. This is not speculation. This, I know this is how it works. Uh, they want to know exactly what you're going to say before you go on. Um, that they want to know that you can boil it down to a bumper sticker and fit it in the time allowed. And they'll give you an hour to decide if you want to come on or not. I know that while, uh, while I was at the BJC, I remember Brent Walker being called by, by one of the cable news networks and um, turning down an appearance. But that's hard to do, especially when you're a nonprofit trying to raise money and trying to have a high profile. But he just couldn't oversimplify a position, boil it down, and be pe pegged at one polar end of the spectrum. I think Christians in the public square should model the third way that may be a bit too nuanced for the cable networks. We should not so easily fall into the us versus them model. As I've heard more than one preacher say here lately, our country would be a lot better off if we would all turn off Rush, Rachel, Keith and Bill and turn on and open up Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> Just totally stole that line. <laughs> but I'm not the first. In the politics, the, the political realm, it's about winning. That's what politics is about. It's about beating your opponent and what do I have to do to win the next election? It's a win at all cost game where too often the ends justify the means. And the way to win is to demean your adversary. I think it is clear that the types of rhetoric and actions often seen by parties and candidates do not comply with some basic understandings of Christian ethics. We need to be careful when we step into that world. Again, thinking that we should. In both media and politics, people of faith need to be careful that when they enter that sphere, their ethical and Christian values influence their actions rather than the no-holds-barred no rules of either two. Also, in my mind, there's a vast difference between politics and public policy. Politics is the competition to determine who makes the policy. You have to understand and account for the former to have a positive impact on the latter. But you can also be politically victorious and have no interest in good public policy whatsoever. I was reminded of this fact during the past legislative session when I was talking to a very conservative Republican mem member of the legislature who found himself on the wrong end 
of some tea party vitriol. And he was so frustrated. He said, I'm being threatened with a primary opponent. They say they're going to fund a challenger, but I consider myself a strong Tea Party patriot. I even went to the rally in Washington. I believe in conservative governance, not in no government whatsoever. You can win the political game, but not care for public policy, in my opinion. And Christians should spend much more time focused on the policy, important issues and problems the government should address, and much less time on the horse race politics that dominate the media. That being said, I'll return to the big questions of who, who, what, and how that I've laid out here today. When we say a Christian voice in the public square, whose voice are we talking about? The local church pastor? Yes, in some instances, the pastor will speak out on issues of political concern. But whether and how to do that, I'm going to leave for Susie's presentation. The church itself as a body, again, in some circumstances, within limitations, the answers may be yes. Unfortunately, I think Dr. Gaddy may talk a little bit more about that this afternoon. That leaves the individual Christian and voter. But Christians do not all agree on the issues. We know this. That means we're talking about voices plural. I think one important cultural development would be that the Christian voice is no longer seen as a monolithic, that there are a variety of Christian viewpoints and many voices speaking out on issues of concern to them, sometimes coming to different conclusions, but unafraid to claim that their conviction is rooted in their faith. Whomever is speaking, as tempting it may be, they must resist the urge to claim that theirs is the only permissible Christian position. It's an easy trap to fall into. Uh, there's a lot of issues we can talk about that seem one-sided. It's part of our role at the CLC to help magnify those voices. We often get calls from Texas Baptists concerned with about a particular issue that we might not necessarily do a lot of work on, although our agenda is very, very broad. Um, but we're happy to host people in our office in Austin, to give them tips on effective advocacy, and introduce them to key legislators working on the issues they're passionate about. Who do Christians speak for? This may seem like a bit of a strange question to you, but it's not strange at all in Austin. It's one of the key characteristics that I believe makes the Christian Life Commission different from other lobby groups and advocacy organizations in Austin. And I think it gains us more respect. When a person or organization walks into the legislative office, you can bet they're asking for something from their, for themselves or their members. It's not always a bad thing. Um, they may be protecting the jobs and livelihoods of their members, but they're acting out of their own self-interest. And now technically the CLC speaks to and with Texas Baptists on a number of issues. But in a very real sense, we try to be, and I like to think that we speak for those who have no voice. Maybe a lobbyist for the least of these in our best days. We work on issues that promote the common good and only rarely on those that would directly benefit our churches or church members. Elected officials understand that difference. It is much harder to be brushed aside when you're not in it for yourself or your own profit. So what should Christians say in the public square? What should they say so they'll be heard? What strategies should they employ to be effective advocates and get their positions across? In my experience, there are basically three ways to be an effective advocate. The first is to play the money game. I think we kind of have an idea about the, what that is. This is, uh, this is how much of the lobby work is done in Austin. The organization or individual hires a well-paid, well-connected lobbyist who has long-established relationships with the decision makers in the legislature. They then often lavish, 
lavish contributions on candidates and form political action committees. They directly support or oppose candidates for office who they know will support their position. And this is typical in both parties. This is how much of the work gets done. But it's stunning uh, as a registered lobbyist when you get invitations to the various fundraisers, uh, just how many names of hosts and sponsors and corporations and PACs and individuals are the same when you get them from the Republican Party and you get them from the Democratic Party. There's an awful lot of overlap. And this method is not inherently wrong, but I think it's deeply troubling. I think it's something we all should be concerned about. But a lecture on the perils of campaign finance system will have to wait to another day. That's a whole other road to go down. <laughs> Uh, while some Christian organizations empl employ this strategy for sure, uh, it's not how the CLC operates. And the money game is really only available to, to the few in the society and the most wealthy among us. The second strategy comes from an in-depth working knowledge of an issue. This type of advocacy is supported by research, studies, facts, and experience. At the CLC, we pride ourselves on knowing a number of issues backwards and forwards. Gambling expansion, of course, we're known for that. Um, but now, um, predatory lending, payday and, and auto title lending. We've begun to lead the state in the efforts to reform that. Human trafficking, another area where we're becoming more and more experts. We've been working on a number of these issues for years. When you pick an issue set or we have an issue set established like ours, believe me, it's job security. <laughs> They're not gonna change that much <laughs> in the number of years. Uh, they they seem, tend to be the same thing, uh, working for the same people on the same issues. Um, but we always try to be prepared with well-reasoned, evidence-based support for our, our position. There, there are those issues like I mentioned, where the legislator, legislatures or, or their staff call us. They want to know more, and they know we work on it, and they call us. It's a hard and time-consuming work, but there are many issue-based organizations in Austin that operate in this manner. And in D.C., the Baptist Joint Committee does the same thing for church-state law and church-state issues. In, in Austin, another great example is Texans Care for Children, established by Phil Strickland. They, are, they have a lot of very smart folks over there who wake up every day and think about how to make changes to policy that are going to benefit the children of the state of Texas. And they, they go in depth with policymakers, arguing that investing in our kids makes good economic sense as well. Because in any argument in Austin, it comes down to economics. And you better be able to show how you make sense of the state finance system, for sure. By starting from a well-informed position, you're a stronger advocate. And I think that Texas Baptists and other denominations are for fortunate to have organizations that they can call on that have this expertise. And it's, it's really a unique benefit to denominational life that that's few folks have. Finally, the third, third strategy is to speak from personal experience, to tell your story when Texas citizens take time to come to Austin and try to make a difference on an issue they're passionate about, legislators do take notice. While it may be only anecdotal evidence of a problem, I have seen time and time again that a single story can become emblematic of a larger problem and move legislators on an issue to change their position. This last session, we saw that time and time again on the payday lending issue. Uh, we had a pastor, this is the first time I've ever seen this happen, we had a pastor come uh, from the valley, from uh, Del Rio actually, Jeff Johnson, and tell the story about how in his town, the, uh, at the MHMR residential facility, when they would receive their monthly uh, check, the payday lenders would come over there and be right there for a loan with them, ready to give them a loan. 
And these folks felt so proud and honored that someone would want to give them a loan that what ended up happening is they, had, they owed their whole check to the payday lenders. He told that story in a hearing in the House, and I'd never heard it. I hadn't seen his testimony. The bill, of course, had already been written. They're testifying on the bill. A new version comes out. And I was very, very involved in this legislation, and all of a sudden it had a new line in there that prohibited those folks, those payday and auto title lenders, from appearing on the grounds of the, such facilities, hospitals, nursing home, MHMR, or advertising there. That's one man, one hearing, made that change. The stories make a difference. And while many individuals have those compelling stories, it's really important to know who to tell and when to tell it. This is when the expertise and understanding of, a, of the legislative process come in handy. Whether that person should just call up their own legislator and tell that story, or maybe a committee chair is the one who really needs to hear it, or maybe there's a hearing coming up with public testimony, and that's when and where they need to be. That's the type of thing we like to do at the Christian Life Commission is let people know when their voice can be most effective, when they can navigate the political system so that their story will have the most impact. Finally, I'd like to take the rest of my time to talk about how Christians should use our voice in the public square. As I've said, how we talk about issues in public is just as important as what we say. We must be cautious because a lot of is riding on this. Not only can we undercut our ability to affect positive change on a grand scale through the political process, but also because non-Christians are watching particularly the younger generation. A Barna Group poll from 2007 was published in a book called Unchristian by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons. It found that 75% of non-Christians aged 16 to 29 considered the church too political. This was the fourth most negative characteristic they had of the church just behind anti-homosexual, judgmental, and hypocritical. Shouldn't we conclude then that the church should just stay out of political issues altogether? I don't think so. I don't think that's what they were touching on. In my experience, members of my generation and younger want a church that's engaged in the world. Maybe they're working on policy more than politics, but they're working on social justice issues. I see time and time again that young people I know who may be church members but not totally engaged in denominational life like what we do at the CLC and the issues we talk about. I think the feeling that the church is too political has a lot more to do with how Christians have been involved in politics. Is it too much to ask Christians to act Christian? To conduct ourselves in word and deed in a manner that only, that not only bears witness to our belief in Christ, but makes it clear that we're trying to pattern our lives after him? What if Christians in the U.S. modeled redemption and reconciliation in the world of politics and public policy? What if we all acted like our political opponent might just sit down on the pew to us next Sunday, pew next to us next Sunday? which is not all that uncommon, actually, <laughs> in First Baptist Austin. Every now and then you turn your head and there's the guy you were just uh, testifying against his bill the week before. <laughs> it happens. But I'm afraid that currently a rather loud group of Christians has allowed the realm of politics to influence their morals and ethics and not the other way around. As a general principle, I believe we must advocate in a way that that those who do not share our faith can feel free to disagree or agree based on the merits of our argument. I think that is very important. You can bring, you can be rooted in your faith and have a faith motivation, but when you come to testify, you need to make the argument in a way that anybody can be free to agree or disagree no matter what faith they hold. We don't need to hide our motivations but we can't act like scripture and faith are the last word on an issue. 
it would, it's very tempting at this point to go through the bad examples on how, to, uh, how not to, to participate in the public realm as a Christian. And maybe just Pat Robertson could be a good poster child for that part of the discussion. But I'm going to refrain from, from doing that uh, at this point. Um, I think I would be violating some of the principles I would like to <laughs> uphold if I did that. I spent the rest of the time name-calling and telling who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong. <laughs> Certainly, we should start with respect and civility. Some very basic tenets that if we truly believe that our brothers and sisters are made in God's image, that should affect how we talk to them, how we treat them, how we see them. And I want to commend to you an interview I saw recently, read recently, between Jimmy Carter and Al Mohler. I don't know if you all saw this. There's an ABP article about it, but it was on the Al Mohler's program. It's fascinating for the content um, and the, the debate they have about um, theological issues primarily. But the fact that they sat down and in public modeled the respect and civility we should all have is very, very important. They don't agree on everything, to say the least, but they took the risk, sat down, and had a discussion, and I think that is so very rare um, in this in this day and age. And I, I kind of imagine what if they had appeared on MSNBC or Fox News and they were there, their heads are up their satellite location. I guarantee you it would not have gone the same way it did as when they sat down and talked to one another. Humility. Sometimes I feel like this is a lost <laughs> characteristics of Christians in the, in the public square that um, there, there's a lot of self-righteousness ex expressed, not just theologically, but also on political issues. But I want to, uh, to quote Barbara Jordan on this issue, and I, and I heard this first from Brent Walker. Um, he has a, a, a chapter in a book in a, in a speech called The Religious American Citizen, where he quotes Barbara Jordan saying, uh, you would do well to pursue your cause with vigor while remembering that you are a servant of God, not a spokesperson for God and remembering that God might well choose to bless an opposing point of view for reasons that have not been revealed to you. Very, very wise words from, from a wise woman. One other way we go about this work that's important is in coalition. That when we're in Austin working on an issue, as I mentioned, there's a handful that we're kind of the experts on and that we lead on hunger issue. We've con convened a new coalition on hunger issues. People sometimes outside of the political realm don't understand coalitions. They like to um, paint the um, guilt by association brush. And I, I think I would be hard pressed to think of another organization in the state that is in coalition working together with other organizations on one common goal that shares as wide a political spectrum as a Christian Life Commission does. When you work on, in coalitions, your voice is magnified. You, uh, you bring relationships and friends to an issue that you wouldn't have if you were by yourself. But that means you're going to work with people that disagree with you on other issues. The Christian Life Commission is in coalitions with the Eagle Forum of Texas and Concerned Women for America, about as conservative as it comes. And then we're in coalitions with Texas Freedom Network, about as progressive as it comes, depending on the issue. And it's important to work in coalition. When, when we're not the experts on one of those issue areas, we rely on our friends, and that's how we get the work done. And it's important to understand that that's a benefit and not, does not detract from your own individual voice or viewpoints at all. We're also nonpartisan. And this is not just to stay on the right side of any 501c3 tax status, it's um, very much intentional that our issues are broad, that uh, we're going to have issues that come straight down the middle of the Republican Party platform and straight down the middle of the Democratic Party platform. And that's important. This, the Christian Life Commission has been around 60 years. You don't hang around that long 
by picking only one set of friends. And this sincerely magnifies our voice in Austin. I, uh, there's not an office to my knowledge that I can't walk into and agree 100% with on some issue and also disagree 100% with on another issue. Um, and that's very important. I was just uh, relate a story uh, that uh, someone was at an event and a legislator was talking and saying things that um, the Christian Life Commission wouldn't necessarily agree with on church state. And uh, I said, he's with us on payday lending. You know, you got to take what you can and you got to work with it. And it's very important to be nonpartisan. It's also important to be sure you're not appealing to fear and anger or that someone is not trying to motivate you based on fear and anger. I think that's very common these days. Now, right, there is a place for right, righteous indignation. Mine happens to be payday lending. I can get real fired up about that real quick. Um, but, but that anger and, and that uh, sentiment should be directed at those who are perpetrating an injustice, not at those who have political di differences from us. I think, finally, you've got to take the long view. As I said, we've been around 60 years. Um, we're going to be around next session, <laughs> and the session after that, and the session after that. And I think uh, sometimes in Austin when groups are busy um, picking winners, picking candidates, and funding them, or creating voter guides that really deceive and, and push people to vote one direction, um, I think people see that as a very temporary work, that this is about next session. And um, what happens if that person's not there? What happens if the one you just um, lost, so the, and the candidate you funded just lost, what's the chance of that other person being very friendly and helping you out on many issues? I think you've got to take the long view decades ahead, not the next election. Finally, I think we should impact the public square in a way that makes it a better place, in a way where we could suggest to our children and our churches that they could choose public service, that they could choose the realm of politics, and that that would be an appealing option. I think that's a, a shame that um, I think our current situation is such that it makes me wonder who would want to get in that business. Um, and I think churches and Christians should model good behavior and hopefully, and maybe a little idealistically, change that field that we're playing on. We have the power to do it if we would just consider how we engage when we engage. Thank you very much. Are you open to a question and answer session briefly? Yes, sir. And I, I don't mean to say briefly in a way to cut you off, but we have a few minutes for question and answer. Would anyone, uh, if, you, if you would, if you have a question, would you stand and, so that we may hear you? And you want to have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, please clarify your use of the concept of nonpartisan. Sure. Because clearly when you're advocating for an issue, you're rather partisan on the issue. So can you clarify for us a little bit how you mean that? Yes. I think when I say nonpartisan as an organization, I mean that um, you cannot be pigeonholed as a arm of a single party. That, um, that if you work on issues that only line up with one party, um, it's very hard to cross that line. And it's very hard to, um, to have influence with folks of the other party. Um, we're kind of stuck with a two-party system here. You have to work in that. You have to understand it. Um, but try and work in both is my suggestion. I think 
I ended about talking about, you know, people actually running for office and candidates, of course they're going to have to go through the party system. They're going to have to go through the financing system. Um, it's difficult, uh, but I, I think that um, there's a few places where those truly bipartisan can be modeled. Uh, you know, I have got um, friends and family on all across the political spectrum, and I'll get asked sometime when I'm talking about an issue, wouldn't it be a lot easier if the Democrats weren't there? Wouldn't it be a lot easier if the Republicans weren't in your way? And some days, yes. <laughs> it sure would be great if this party would say, you do this, and they all did it, and it was our issue, and we're in good shape. Um, but as I do my work, I actually find myself becoming less and less partisan. When you focus on the policy, the partisan tends to fade away. Because you're going to find folks who break the mold, who, who are on both sides of the aisle and who, who, who agree with you. But also, you're going to know people personally, individually. I know Susie's going to talk about this in a minute. Um, there are um, people in both parties, you know, that I will, maybe the, uh, the party I typically agree with a lot of things, some would say, oh, that's, she's a, this party and that's all great. And I'm like, no, actually, she's not very smart. She's not very committed. She's not trying to do the right thing. And we, they may be the party I agree with sometimes, but that's, when it comes to issues, when it comes to policy, not helpful. <laughs> or, yeah, he's a different party than I, than I am sometimes, but uh, he's smart and committed and wants to do the right thing. And we can find things to agree on and we can work towards that. So the party system is there. You have to maneuver it. But I think there are ways to do it where you can um, overcome it in, in when you're looking at particular policy issues. So. Someone else? Back here in the back, please. Thank you. Uh, me and my friend Kathleen are going to Washington, D.C. this summer. Great. And uh, we both study, she studies mathematics and political science. I study business administration and political science for the academy here. Yeah. And we were just, um, I was wondering, I'm sure that she's thinking the same thing. You know, being thrown kind of into a kind of like a bloodbath of politics, uh, they can all hold where all business is centered around politics. And I remember talking about how that's a good question I, I lived and worked in Washington DC for about two and a half years and um, it's a wonderful place I hope you have a, a great summer you're gonna you're gonna meet a lot of smart dedicated people who are who are really are trying to do the right thing and um, are very young and are making very little money and working very hard <laughs> um, I would say um, try and reach out to people who you don't agree with. Um, if it's an, are you going to be like an intern on the Hill or something like that? Or? We don't quite know yet, but probably more on the business side. Okay. Well, in any case, you're, you're uh, especially when you have Hill internships, you're going to socialize with people who are working for people of the other party. And I think that's important to get perspective. Um, I also think just try and forget about it sometimes. <laughs> Um, get out, uh, try and put yourself out and, and enjoy uh, the things that DC has to offer. And, um, you know, it, sometimes it's, it's kind of a heavy weight to be thinking about these things all the time. And it can turn you into cynical in a real big hurry. Um, but um, go hang out with somebody who's not in it. <laughs> uh, go talk to your family, go do something else. It's, uh, it sounds very... Um, kind of trite or simple, but it's true. I just think, you know, do something different. Go to Great Falls, go for a hike, go do something else. <laughs> get, get out, quit reading the Washington Post all day, every day, and actually go, go enjoy it, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes. Wow, that's a whole nother lecture. But um, what I said was people essentially who think that you shouldn't talk about political issues in the church because that violates the separation of church and state, they, you know, they have a, a misunderstanding of that separation and I think have a narrow view of the gospel. I think 
that um, when you look at the life and ministry and work of Jesus, time and time again, he is doing things that when done today in our society have serious political implications. They were, done, they were that way then, too. But um, it's hard to not see um, miracle after miracle of healing and not think, hmm, maybe we should be concerned about health care. Um, that uh, there, he was a, inherently a political figure. And um, to follow him and talk about and care about the things he cared about is still going to bring us into that arena today. So it's about as short as I can get on that, most likely. So. We're going to uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to tarry too long and overlook probably what I should say some of the most important things. Uh, simply put, she also has had a, a long-term interest in uh, literacy. And so I find it very interesting, the National Literacy Professional Professor and Consultant. Uh, and I don't know what she will say about lecturing, but uh, Stephen, she has been a faculty member, so maybe Maybe she's more comfortable with a lecture or not. So, married to Roger Painter, Dr. Roger Painter, senior pastor of First Baptist Church of Austin, native of San Antonio, Texas, graduate of Baylor University, University of Louisville, Kentucky, Stephen F. Austin University. We're glad to have her here. Susie Painter, welcome her, please. Good afternoon. I'm happy to see that this podium is not going to block me off to here. <laughs> Thank you. I want to uh, extend my thanks to the university, to Dr. Ellis particularly. Uh, what a great institution this is. What great leaders, what great professors, what great products and students. And, you know, we have been blessed many, many ways by the greatness of Howard Payne and the way in which human lives are valued, developed, and launched from this place. And I so appreciate the legacy of this school, and I am so proud to be a part of your future. Uh, and I pledge my support to this university, to those of you in leadership, to your faculty, and that the resources of the Christian Life Commission, I hope you see as a partnership to everything in this school. Um, I can't... Uh, go by the beginning of this also without saying thanks to David for the way in which you've mentored me, been my friend and supporter, and of course to Phil uh, in his memory. But even more than that, the living legacy of Carolyn Strickland. Yeah. Now this is no small force, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and we know that a lot of Phil's good qualities were only made better <laughs> by his marriage to Carolyn. Uh, her focus and her love for others and her energy and willingness to put that into action. Uh, she has been a sister in Christ to me and a friend. And uh, I learned from Phil, and boy, I was blessed in unexpected ways by my relationship with Carolyn, and I continue to be. So thank you, Carolyn, very much for this. My topic is leading your church to be politically responsible. Just to be clear, let me tell you now, okay? You do have it harder than most. Because when it comes to leading churches to be politically responsible as Baptists, as churches of congregational polity and structure, the autonomy of our local congregations leaves us as clergy and as lay leaders pretty much solo in the public square. As solo flyers, we're more like Amelia Earhart than American Airlines <laughs> when it comes to cruising uh, successfully into political engagement. Our solo status structure of congregational autonomy sets us apart from the processes and structures used in other Christian denominations to cushion and distance the vulnerability of local clergy and the local congregation in the public square. Catholic tradition and mainline denominations like Episcopalian, Lutheran, and Methodist they're more like the American Airlines model. Now, what I mean by that 
is that the local clergy and religious leaders do not enter the airspace alone. Uh, for each of these venerable Christian traditions, there are various judicatories and their judicatory structures that include bishops and other ecclesiastical bodies which are not directly answerable to one local congregation. They're the ones that write and compile the social teachings uh, that are often used and applied in the political realm. There's a set of usually very well researched and rather prescribed teachings Often the same judicatory bodies have these very highly skilled communications departments too that draft and edit statements and then they pass them down to congregations and pass them on to the press. Uh, we saw this just recently when the decision was made by the Catholic bishops on contraception. The decision I think was made on Tuesday and by Sunday in every single Catholic parish in the United States the same encyclical was read. Not so for us Baptists. Our very congregational autonomy and independence make our efforts to be active in the public square fall, well, squarely on the shoulders of our pastors and congregational leaders. Now, this is a significant and under-recognized burden. There is no turning to the congregation when you're out on the end of a politically fragile limb and saying, Oops, the bishop made me do it. <laughs> the fragmentation of our own Baptist identity and structures has also left the local pastor and the church to feel vulnerable, more Amelia Earhart-like than ever if they venture out into the public square because factions within our own community can take shots at us from all sides. Now, I'm, I'm not making light of this at all. This is a true dilemma. It is a true dilemma because the issues and demands of our day cry out for more robust engagement of the church. But frankly, it is the rare Baptist congregational leader who successfully can navigate the skill of responsible political leadership as part and parcel of a daily ministry. You know, folks, it's tough to be Amelia. The reality of this solo flying makes our brief discussion of this topic today important and worthy. And I hope that by looking at some lessons, maybe our solo flying could look more like Charles Lindbergh than Amelia Earhart, <laughs> with a safe and celebrated landing rather than disappearance from the public square. So a few principles for leading your church to be politically responsible. Six things to say. Number one, be the leader. Be the leader that looks beyond the walls of your church. The mantle of ministry and the call of Christ are not simple hobbies or a nine to five job. The mantle of ministry and the call of Christ has made you a steward of leadership. And the scope of this leadership goes beyond the walls of your church, your school, and your home. If you are not extending leadership into the community around you and its needs, then you haven't embraced the whole ministry of Jesus Christ, and you are missing out on the vitality of the gospel that can come with it. When the gospel says, go into the world, when it says, God so loved the world, when Jesus says, follow me, and then he up and tramps around from city to city? Or when he stands at the walls of Jerusalem looking down on a city full of strangers, facing his own imminent suffering, but what does he say? Oh, God, I wish I could bring them to me like a hen brings her chicks. This kind of compassion... This kind of love in the face of Jesus is showing us how to be more than the leader of our church. It is showing us how to be the leader from our church into the community, in the state, in the world. Now this is a matter of prayer and discipline because we all know that your local church, your family, your school can take every minute and consume your heart with only those needs. So number one, be a leader. 
Number two, leader, meet leader. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, go meet an elected official, or two, or five. Now, it is your duty, it is your duty as a congregational leader and a citizen to meet the civic leaders around you. This is personal. Drop by, leave a card, meet the staff. Tell them about your church and its ministry, and especially if you're a lay person. Go meet an elected official and tell them that your church is important to you and the ministries that your church does in the community. Um, some of the best advice I ever got was surprising advice it, on how to meet elected officials. It came from LBJ's secretary. Uh, when we first arrived at uh, First Baptist Austin, Mildred Stiegel was still living and an active member of our church. She had been LBJ's secretary for many years, and that in itself should get her a four-star award, I think. <laughs> but in talking to her one day, as I began to, as Phil called me into this work on behalf of the Christian Life Commission, and I began to meet with elected officials, I sat down to next to her and I said, Mildred, tell me about this. And she said, well... You just treat these guys like they had just visited your church. She said, in fact, it's just a lot like church visitation. <laughs> what she meant was you don't have to have an issue to connect. What she meant was it's their job to know the community. And it's our job for leaders to meet leaders. So today, as you leave, there's some blue books out here. This has the elected official of every House and Senate district and the congressional districts. It has their pictures, got their phone numbers, got their emails, got their drive-by, but let me just make this perfectly clear. You can see these little green signs all over Texas, and every time you drive by one, I hope your conscience just goes, ooh, I'm supposed to go meet that person. Because there is nothing like personal connections. You know, politics is more like high school than it is like anything else. It is who you know. <laughs> it is where you saw them. And, and, and politicians are so, they're so primed to connect. And you know, so many pastors and religious leaders are, feel like, oh, I can't go meet politicians. They're so different from me. Uh-uh, they're just like you. I mean, just like you. They, they got to know a lot of people just like you do. They got to remember names just like you do. They got to know people and being, uh, you know, and they want to make connections. So it's a lot, lot better than you might think. Um, so leader, meet leader. Um, don't be surprised, too, if these folks show up after you've met them. This happens all the time. Uh, I know what Stephen was referring to a while ago, because it wasn't too long ago at First Baptist. Uh, First Baptist Austin, although the Christian Life Commission fights against gambling tooth and toenail until we think that's about the elephant in the room, uh, with casinos, every shred of effort that we have, there was uh, one Sunday morning I looked up in worship and three rows in front of me was the uh, sponsor of the biggest gambling bill in the house. And he was also the chairman of a very influential committee. I sat down on my row and all of a sudden, the deacon on the end of my row, sitting down next to about five people down from me, starts passing me a note written on the back of the offering envelope. And it says, Susie, now we'll see what kind of Christian you really are. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I wasn't tempted. <laughs> but, but seriously, meet your leaders and truly care about them. You may not like government or politics in general, but let me tell you what. We have got the best country in the world. We have got the best system of government in the world, and we have the best freedoms in the world, and these are kept in place by people who expect you to walk in and get to know them. I tell you what, the thing I hate to hear worse from pastors is, well, these, well I don't know, you know, it's, nobody pays attention to the church anymore. Go meet people. Put your church, put Christ in living color. Here's my question. What doors are left open? What doors are made to open because you meet a civic leader? And what doors are left unopened because you don't? Not too long a favorite pastor of mine called, <laughs> called me and he said that he was surprised to get a phone call from an elected official. 
Now, this uh, elected official, she called long distance from the floor of the House of Representatives. He said, I don't really know her, but there was an upcoming vote on something to had, that had to do with church day schools, and her office had my card. We had a nice discussion, he said. I think I helped her. Number two, leader, meet leader. Number three, you don't lead a church to be politically responsible by starting with politics. You start with mission and ministry. Have you ever been out of town at a convention, a uh, convention center, big old convention center, or big, one of these big giant malls, and you're like down in one of the parking garages, and you come up in an elevator, and you don't know where you are, and you look for one of these monolithic signs that has the diagrams on it, and you're searching around on those lines until you find those three precious words, you are here. <laughs> That's how it is with ministry. You are here. Every congregation is somewhere in ministry. The beginning of relevant change in the world for Christians is at the intersection of compassion and energy. These are the things that are going to change the world. Your compassion of Christ and your energy to act on it. And this is where the bona fide work in the political realm really comes from. You know, it's the difference between a plant with a root system and cut flowers that die after a few days. When your political action, when your action in the public square comes out of the ministry that your church already has a fingerprint on, that will be the work of God. Not something that's trumped up out of the clear blue sky. Who in your congregation is already leading a compassion ministry? Is it formal and organized, or is it just informal? This is very often the doorway into the world for a Christian voice, because there's hardly a ministry, there's hardly a mission on the surface that doesn't underneath have a justice issue begging for someone to take action. The last le legislative session as Stephen mentioned, more than 14 pastors came to testify about the abuses of payday and auto title lending. For most of them, their testimony was directly from experiences of people in their congregations. They had been victims of debt traps and schemes. Their churches had rallied to help their friends pay off these egregious debts. And that act of compassion brought energy and these pastors showed up to testify in force. This highlights a fact of leadership, that championing an issue does not have to be a congregational consensus. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But these issues do have to be worthy of respect and integrity, and best if they are rooted in some mission of compassion. In fact, championing an issue that as a result of ministry in your congregation is a great way to model politically responsible leadership. One pastor was very effective at getting a bus stop near his church. <laughs> now, this came to him, um, and he got concerned over it because the, the fact was that children in this area were having to cross a very busy multi-lane street at peak traffic time to catch their bus to school. He learned of this need from those people waiting in line at the Tuesday food pantry in his church. Now, he had plenty to do on his church calendar. He had lots of other things to pay attention to. His kids had soccer games just like everybody else. He could have just let it go, but he didn't. His action on their behalf became the unexpected point of notoriety for his church by the whole community. You are here. What ministry is offering you the opportunity to speak for justice in your community? This is your gateway to responsible political engagement. Number four. Another act of politically responsible leadership is to embrace the few who do. 
<laughs> now, by this I mean it is not necessary to have a whole congregation respond to some issue or effort for it to be impactful, prophetic, and transforming. Having a few who do, I mean, frankly, that's what church is, isn't it? We are the body of Christ. An ear, an arm, a foot, an ankle. We all have different callings. Very few things in our churches are accomplished by 100% of the congregation. I mean, really. And I think it's a misguided effort to try to exact consensus and solidarity from a congregation around an issue of public importance when, frankly, most of our congregations <laughs> have trouble having consensus and solidarity about a lot of things that have to do with the church itself. So that is true within our congregation, and it is no, it's no shame to have a few people being active on an issue and making a difference on that issue and on many issues. Now, it's true on the power and political side as well. It doesn't take a whole congregation to affect change in a legislator's office. It doesn't take a whole congregation to affect change at a city council or even in Congress. Three visits, a few phone calls, the right words from a trusted friend can be very powerful in a process. Two consecutive visits from a few thoughtful people will most times accomplish more than a group of 30 people crowding into somebody's office on one of these herd visits. It happens. <laughs> exactly. As a leader, you can be aware of the value of the few that do. Calling comes to us that way. Allow people to speak their calling and gather folks together. And as a leader of the congregation, encourage them, equip them, and take seriously this charge of equipping many people to speak on behalf of issues that they have a passion about. Even if it's not your issue or your passion. Being politically responsible can mean encouraging a variety of actions from these few who do. And you will show that you are a leader who is truly nonpartisan by encouraging other people's work. Number five, managing the hungry beasts. Um, leading your church, I said managing the hungry beasts. Leading your church to be politically responsible can sometimes mean like a shepherd that you keep the wolves at bay. There is no shortage of groups and causes that want to make an appeal on Sunday morning or saturate your church members' emails, networks, inboxes, and now text messages with all manner of causes and calls to action. The goal in these efforts is usually a way of harvesting numbers. Now, Many grant-funded causes, and I don't mean, I mean all of them, whether you're for them or against them, many causes that come to your church are funded by grants that are measured by how many names can they get, how many dollars can they get, how many contacts can they get. And frankly, even if you love the cause and think that 100% of your church would be for it, beware if somebody wants to use your church contact information and harvesting numbers from your congregation is involved, avoid the email blasts and the call to actions from other groups and refrain from sending things to everyone in the church. Too often, the causes that seek to use the church for a database also issue a call to action that's meant for short-term effect. Now, it effectively has Christians on one hand either invoking overblown praise and adoration in terms that you can hardly stomach, or it has us pronouncing such vilifying curses that we think about it a day later and think, you know what, my church would never send out something that sounds like that in any other way we communicate. So manage the beasts at the door. And I, our personal experience, I, mean, I can't tell you how many times. We've been offered so much money for the, your list and your emails and your numbers. And I mean, there's any group in the world that has offered us, we'd be millionaires. We'd be sitting on top of the world if we'd sold out like that. But you have to be diligent and truly Christian. We are not giving away the people of God. 
And we can't do that on a congregational level either. Number six, be unapologetic to bring a thoughtful, theological, and biblical rationale to any issue. But at the same time, avoid religious trappings that are marketed as full faith. Bring on the theological perspective, and by that I mean your honest convictions and your reasonable arguments to any issue in any circumstance. Speak about the biblical and theological rationale that you have. Now I'm going to tell you a big fat secret. There's enough biblical knowledge in this room. There's ten times more biblical knowledge in this room than there is at the Capitol in Austin, Texas. I'm going to tell you something I've learned from working with all kinds of interfaith groups and other Christian groups and other people, blah, blah, blah. We know the Bible, folks. We know it. A lot of people cannot open their mouth and talk about Scripture. This is a, this is a special gift that we as Baptists have been given. And I think we keep our gift hidden under a bushel all too often by not opening our mouth and giving a thoughtful, biblical, and theological reflection on the issue. And just to put a plug in here, that's one of the things that we try to provide through the Christian Life Commission through our publication called Therefore. And you can find them on our website on, oh, I don't know, we've got 40 or 50 topics. But the whole first half of the of the paper is a biblical and theological rationale to give you a framework to talk from faith with meat on the bones and not just some bumper sticker words that come flying by. Now, William Neal commented on this many years ago, and I, but I love this quote. He said, we cannot keep religion and politics separate. This is not a live option. The only choice facing us is whether we're going to relate our real religion to the social scene in a critical and redemptive way, or are we going to refuse to do so and see a pseudo-religion sucked in that's full of authority but weak on discernment? There is a kind of caricature that comes to mind with this type of pseudo-religion. It's long on self-prescribed authority and very short on discernment or complexity. This pseudo-religion is almost a living religious cartoon it's a person glad-handing and blustering with excessive piety. Too loud, too close, and too dominant. Even genuine religious conviction now can be mistaken for this. This is such a common caricature. That your genuine religious conviction that you come and speak out of devotion of your heart, you can be misinterpreted by legislative staff. Oh, that's just one of those blustering religious types. Because this kind of pseudo-religion can overwhelm the decision maker. One legislative staff person uh, once introduced me as from the Christian Life Commission, and she turned to her colleagues who were new on the staff and said, now this is one of the real religious groups, not an issue group with religious ties. I thought that was an interesting way of categorizing us among, among the many groups that come into their office. So leading a church to be politically responsible is leading individuals in the process of discernment to help them find their full and true faith voice. This is not just the job of the pastor. This is, this is the job of every Sunday school teacher. To help the people in your class be able to talk about their faith, to, how it matters, what, how they would you know, like connect scriptures to different issues that they care about. An effective strategy is, when you're talking to somebody, is to listen for the ways in which they use religious words. And then think, ask them a question. Oh, I heard you say this. You know, what, how does that connect to the scripture? Or let me tell you what scripture comes to mind when I hear you say that. Be a teacher in those moments. So that the depth of our theological rationale and explanation for the things we believe in comes through loud and clear. Now, the corollary to the importance of this engagement of a theological rationale is to be aware that for many in the public square, having a religious motivation for a policy is not enough to make them willing to vote for you, uh, vote your way. This is a political reality that requires us to be able to express our faith and our formed rationale and biblical foundation, but recognize that decision makers may not base their decision on our rationale. 
So then you might say, so why bring a biblical or faith rationale to the public square? Well, let me give you an example on human trafficking. I serve on the, attorney, on the Attorney General's Task Force on Human Trafficking. We have been working for six years systematically to change more than 35 laws in the state of Texas to change the way that we can prosecute perpetrators and support victims of human trafficking. It is a complicated, legal, social service, prosecutorial, law enforcement, da -da 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 -da. there's a lot of people in the room, there's a lot of things to be discussed. It is policy, 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 policy. It is section so, it's code five, it's section nine, it's paragraph subsection this, we're gonna add this comma, we're gonna add this phrase. We're in this thing. This one woman is in there and she says, um, I just wanna take a moment and tell you about why I'm here and she said, and we were talking about victim services, and she said, I've been trying to get victim services in, and that's why I was chosen to be on this task force. And she said, well, I, just want to, I just want to put one phrase in here so that you understand why victim services is so important. And she says, a phrase I never expected to hear, imago Dei. She says, the face of God. I work with these girls. They ran away from home. They thought they were going to be so cool and smoke cigarettes with a boyfriend and they ended up with a pimp. And now I'm trying to put their lives back together. Imago Dei. It's the face of God that I see in these girls when I work with them. I've worked on that task force for four more years. And two years ago, I started keeping count. I've heard that phrase from that one thing. I've heard other people say, Imago Dei. Imago Dei, Imago Dei. The value of a theological and scriptural rationale can't be overstated. Not because it might turn somebody's vote, but because of the moral foundation that you're leaving behind. You don't know when that will be used for you. Um, some of you have heard me tell this story, and that is one day I was called by a legislator, and she said, she was obviously angry, and she said, I want to meet you in my office in 20 minutes. Be there before I get there. Yes, ma'am, I said. I went down there. I was sitting in a chair. She comes blustering in. She's so upset, and she's so mad. And so she pulls her chair up, her office chair. She puts her feet in the seat, and she sits on the back of the chair. She's standing way over me like that. And she says, I am so mad at you. Really? I said, I'm so sorry. She said, yeah. She said, I was all set on this issue, I knew how I was going to vote, and I'm still going to vote that way, but you came in here and you started talking to me about this, and all this pain that was going to cause people, and she said, and now I'm really mad at you because I was perfectly happy with my vote, I'm still going to vote that way, but now I'm upset about it. I'm thinking about all these things you said. I don't like that. You know what I'm thinking? Yeah, I'm glad I did. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she was... Um, she was a morally conflicted person. She went on to tell me that she was from a poor district, but she had to take a lot of campaign contributions from very wealthy donors, and this created a lot of tension. And she, now the sad addendum to that story, I mean, I could tell that day when I talked to her, she was a morally conflicted person. Two years later, she was indicted. And you know what, it didn't surprise me. So what you say about the moral it's, it's what you leave behind. It's the seed that it plants. And you turn that over to God and trust it to him because he will use it and grow it. There's real value in respecting the political process while maintaining the perspective that in the end, politics is totally insufficient. <laughs> it is insufficient to the needs of the world. It is not an answer. It is a process. So bring your unapologetic biblical and theological rationale into any issue. I want to end by saying, number one, the Christian Life Commission is there to help you. And I want to say, number two, you are needed in the public square. And this is not just me saying it. You may not know that the reason the Christian Life Commission has an Austin office is because the Speaker of the House of Representatives asked Phil Strickland, no, begged Phil Strickland <laughs> to have an Austin office. He said, we need more faith voices at the Texas legislature. My encouragement to you is to be a church capable of response to the great needs of the world 
beginning with ministry and ending with justice. Knowing that the way is a somewhat solo flight for us, but we are not alone in the, wor in the work. Just when I think it's all confusing or dawning, I remember this Reinhold Niebuhr quote. The final wisdom of life requires not the annulment of incongruity, but the achievement of serenity within and above it. Politics is always a contest of power. But by leading our congregations, hopefully, we arrive at something of an attentive equilibrium of power, enabled by a very great God and assisted by those of us, a few willing leaders. Thank you. Great job indeed. Great job indeed. Today we wish to recognize three students in a particular way, and I'm going to call him to the podium now to say a few brief words about that, and I will assist him in making these presentations. Dr. Hatch, welcome. Thank you. Here at Howard Payne, we're very blessed uh, with our undergraduate students, uh, and we are always looking for ways to brag on them and to show them off and to say, look, these students are doing great work. Um, and so beginning this year, the faculty of the School of Christian Studies um, decided to uh, create an award uh, that would be based on our evaluation of uh, our students' achievement in their courses and the ways in which they have excelled in thinking in and related to the field of Christian ethics, um, that we would select several students that we would give this award to. Uh, these students are not only hard workers in their classes, though they are that, um, but they show an insatiable desire to learn and to bring the depth of Christian theology into conversation with the pressing issues and concerns of our world in a variety of ways. So this year we've selected three students uh, to be named as 2012 Curry Strickland Scholars in Christian Ethics. Each of them will be presented uh, with a commemorative certificate as well as uh, the first volume of James William McClendon's Systematic Theology which is entitled Ethics. Uh, for those of you that don't know uh, McClendon, uh, he was a postmodern Baptist theologian uh, who has had tremendous influence on Christian thought um, and uh, hopefully uh, continuing significance uh, in the years ahead. Um, he's been influential in my own life and the lives of many others, uh, it seems, uh, among us today. Uh, so he, McLennan continually sought to integrate ethics and theology uh, so that each could mutually inform the other. And we find that these students also uh, in some way continue in that McLennanite heritage. And so we want to honor them in that regard. So to the awards, let me introduce this year's recipients and tell you a little bit about them and maybe embarrass them a, a tad bit. Um, the first is Rachel Wool. Uh, she's a junior social work major from Austin. Uh, her favorite class so far here at Howard Payne has been disciple making from the inside out. Uh, when she finishes at Howard Payne, ultimately she plans to become a licensed professional counselor in social work and to use that training uh, to rehabilitate women and girls rescued from human sex trafficking. So, Rachel Wool. <laughs> The second is uh, Ryan Hogan, who is a junior, almost senior practical theology major from Cedar Park. His favorite class here at Howard Payne is a history of Christianity. Um, he plans on doing ministry with those who are entangled in the, uh, the horrible misery of poverty um, when he finishes here at Howard Payne. Uh, so let's, let's thank him as well. Rachel and Ryan. Well, the, the third student is Adam Hardy, who is a graduating senior uh, political science, Academy of Freedom, and Biblical Languages major from Corpus Christi. Uh, his favorite class, he told me, was uh, British literature. Uh, he plans when he finishes here at Howard Payne to either go into graduate school in film um, or work as a videographer for a nonprofit that specializes in restoring those re rescued from sex trafficking. Um, he has done previous work in screenwriting and director uh, of Justice Films. Uh, those familiar with uh, BGCT's film competition may have seen Adam's work in that regard. Uh, unfortunately, he is unable to be here because he is in a film competition. So he is actually on his way to that right now in Virginia. So, uh, but we once again, we, we did want to honor him and, and uh, even though we can't embarrass him quite the same way, uh, we did want to honor him in that regard. So please once again join me in congratulating these students.
we come to the lecture entitled Preaching an Election Year. Uh, that title was suggested by the Program Planning Committee. Uh, we were uh, talking together and we had a local pastor who was uh, on the committee with us and he was talking about the challenges that sometimes go with preaching in a time like this and somehow how you try to negotiate those waters and so we were discussing that and we talked about this as an appropriate part of the the faith in politics um, emphasis that we were having and we had uh, input uh, from uh, David Curry and Carolyn Strickland a bit about some of the the folks that were would be meaningful not only for this particular program but just people that we, we'd like to have along the way as you know, the significant relationships are a big part of what we do. And by the way, that's not just a part of this lectureship series. We, we hope and pray that's a part of what we do at Howard Payne. It's about relationships and about, about what happens. But uh, so the invitation went out uh, to Dr. C. Welton Gaddy. Knowing what he does and how busy he is, we weren't sure he'd be available. Uh, before I introduce him, I simply, he made quite an impression on me when he said, for David and his family, I'd go anywhere at any time. That's the kind of respect this man has for David Curry, uh, and also the kind of respect that, that David has for, for him. You saw David sort of choke up a bit uh, when he was uh, talking about the Welton Gaddy earlier. He is the president of Interfaith Alliance, say more about that in a moment, pastor of preaching and worship at Northminster Church, Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, someone who has to, gets to, wants to preach regularly. And so we look forward to hearing what he has to say. He is, of course, a prolific author, author of more than 20 books, including First Freedom First, A Citizen's Guide to Protecting Religious Liberty and the Separation of Church and State. Uh, he leads the Interfaith Alliance, which has been described as a national nonpartisan grassroots and educational organization. He continues to preach regularly as pastor for preaching worship at Northminster Baptist Church in Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, he hosts a, a weekly State of Belief radio program where he explores the role of religion in the life of the nation by illustrating the vast diversity of beliefs in America while exposing and critiquing, this is I found interesting, both the political manipulation of religion for partisan purposes and the religious manipulation of government for sectarian purposes. It's no small task, huh? Uh, it's a wonderful thing. He provides regular commentary. He and, and David Curry are good friends, and I suspect that one of the reasons they are is because they have some similarity in character and personality. I, I noticed I, I couldn't keep from chuckling this past week when I, I saw our, our lecturer's name uh, show up and, and uh, elicited some response because he made a comment that he thought one particular candidate was maybe uh, using faith in, in the political process in a divisive way. Not everyone agreed with that and it was a wee bit controversial I thought, I need to call David Curry and think if we should withdraw the invitation since it, if somebody controversial is on the program. I thought, no, nah, David won't care. Matter of fact, he'll probably like it. <laughs> no, it's great. It's really great. Dr. Gaddy made time to come out of respect for David, but also to be with us today. And, and I just, I feel honored to be here. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. And he will be with us and with the students in the morning. We'll talk to a, a preaching class and look forward to spending that time with him and with the students as well. Welcome, Dr. Welton Gaddy. Thanks for the uh, invitation to be with you and uh, especially to be with you for the uh, Curry Strickland Distinguished Lectures. I'm eager to get to the uh, topic that has been assigned, but I, I simply must take a, a few moments just to acknowledge my appreciation for Howard Payne and for my association with the school really over a long 
uh, period of time. I think this is my either my third or fourth time to be asked to lecture here, and each experience has been a rewarding one. That goes back uh, for several years. As I told the dean uh, the, exactly what he has just said to you, uh, I would say yes to the invitation, uh, not just because of uh, David Curry's name, but also because of Phil Strickland's name. And if I had known then that uh, Carolyn was going to be here as she is, uh, I would have said because I would do anything to get to see her again as well. She is a lot easier to talk with than David Curry. Um, <laughs> I, um, and, and I understand that's not a great compliment, but it, 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 uh, Phil and Carolyn Strickland were good friends with my wife, Judy, and me, their girls. Our two boys played together at Glorietta and Ridgecrest and other places. Few people have done more with measurable effectiveness for the good of Texans, neither needing nor claiming praise for his work than Phil Strickland. I've always thought, and I've never said this in public uh, that I know of, I, I've always thought that Phil's life changed forever because of his visit to India as a part of his work on uh, helping the poorest of the poor and the weakest of the weak. The depth of Phil's compassion and the weight of his desire to help hurting people took a toll on his physical health even though it strengthened his spirit. For me to talk about the person I know best whose last name is Curry is to talk about a dear friend with whom across the years I have related as a friend, a colleague, I was his pastor, not responsible for his actions. He has been a board member at the Interfaith Alliance. We have made trouble together. We have encouraged people together. David Curry epitomizes a, a Baptist West Texas cowboy who would take lessons to preserve if he ever thought he was losing either the swagger in his walk or the dialect that allows him to make three-letter words sound like polysyllabic phrases. <laughs> Not only am I honored by the school to do one of these lectures, I'm pleased to be able to identify with these two friends who deserve to be heroes for all of us. David Curry and Phil Strickland represent the very best of our historic Baptist tradition. Fiercely independent, but instinctively bent toward cooperation for the common good. Now to the subject at hand, preaching in an election year. How to be prophetic without being partisan. In one sense, the matter is a simple one. A good minister does the same thing in her or his sermons in an election year as is done in any other year. That's the bottom line. The context of preaching is the same. The history of the church and an examination of God's word in relation to human situations within a specific congregation the script of preaching is the same. The Bible, the authority for preaching is the same. Compliance with the gospel and sensitivity to the leadership of God. And the purpose for preaching is the same. To share good news. To shine divine light on the personal and social dimensions of a situation in a manner that causes an individual 
to move closer to God, develop a strong faith, become active in civic affairs, and seek to live guided by the wisdom and love of God. A sensitive preacher will no more neglect the needs and opportunities of an election year than a crisis in the community, a tragedy that imposes great grief, pressing theological questions, massive unemployment in a membership and other needs of pastoral care, or a local celebration which has gripped a community's attention. Good preaching is timely more than timeless. Though the truths in our work should be eternal, the application of those truths should be as local as the city limits or the national mindset or a neighborhood hardware store. If years after our ministries have concluded, a person reads our sermons and cannot, by reading those sermons, identify specifically the time period in which we lived and the issues that were confronting us there, then the incarnational principle so important in Christian preaching has been neglected. An election year does impose on a preacher a specific context of preaching outside the church that is present even if not acknowledged and should not be neglected inside the church. For example, uh, allow me to mention just a few of the elements of that context in this particular election cycle. That context is marked by a sharply divided nation. Tragically, religions in the nation are as divided as politicians. And sadly, the fault lines of those divisions in both religion and politics overlay each other. We're divided by the same things. Both religious leaders and civic leaders should recognize that our role here in that context has to have something to do with reconciliation and cooperation or we may be preaching something other than the gospel. We're also a nation still tremendously frightened by images of terrorist attacks on our land that feed insecurity and that is enhanced by a plummeting economy that has stunned people, altered the way of life for many, and has caused some to change retirement plans, life habits, and increase their insecurity. It is a context filled with political consultants and their clients on the campaign trails who turn religion into a campaign strategy and houses of worship into voting blocks that need to be organized and manipulated. It is a context in which some religious leaders are as eager to be used as the politicians are to use them. Scores of religious leaders want access to political power, not hoping to speak truth to power, but hoping to advance by law narrow sectarian values that they haven't been able to get their people to embrace by free choices. It is a context in which there are well-organized campaigns aimed at enlisting ministers to violate campaign law and risk losing a congregation's tax-deductible identity by endorsing candidates from the pulpit. I have testified, I guess, three times before congressional committees about the danger of bills supporting that kind of 
effort introduced regularly that would not only allow ministers to endorse a particular candidate from the pulpit as a part of the ministry of the pastor, but would also allow, in some versions, to devote a part of the collected tithes and offerings of that church to the candidate's campaign. Now let me be clear. I am for freedom. Some people say that this is a prohibition against free speech. It's not a prohibition against free speech. It is a protection of the integrity of the church. It is protection for the independence of the government. If a pastor, imam, rabbi, or another religious leader wants to endorse a candidate, a congregation can allow that to happen. However, it just can't allow political partisanship supported by tax-deductible gifts. And those who complain to us at Interfaith Alliance for working against that kind of policy change and change in IRS law, we say to them, all you have to do in order to carry on that kind of stuff in your pulpit is to change the primary identity of your church from a religious institution to a political advocacy institution. And then you can do it. But you can't use all of our money to do support for the candidate that you happen to think is the proper one. The other part of that context is that we are in a near pre-First Amendment situation in which many people no longer even understand religious freedom, much less demand respect for it and protection of it. Now you know and I know all of these issues could be talked about and we could go on for the, the whole evening. That is only a quick glimpse at a part of the context in which this year's political campaigns are taking place. The complexity of the context emphasizes the necessity of careful study and responsible preaching. Preaching during an election year has been made more difficult by a startling misunderstanding of the proper relationship between religion, government, and politics. But we have to do it. The challenges are not challenges to silence us. They are ch challenges to evoke responsibility from us responsibility that evidences study and wisdom. We must preach sermons that enlighten our listeners on the issues at stake in the election without compromising our integrity as religious leaders, eroding the sanctity of our houses of worship, or hindering the vitality of our democracy. Now against that all too briefly sketch backdrop, I have a few observations and suggestions to share. I'm not going to tell you how many of them there are. Susie only had six. I, I can tell you I have more than that, but I don't have ten. I've, I've stayed away from that lest someone want to post them somewhere. Um, first, partisan politics must never be confused with prophetic proclamation. Partisanship, someone asked this question earlier, partisanship serves only the interests of one part of the nation through using religion as a wedge of division. Prophetic preaching is filled with calls to justice and revelations of hindrances to justice for the good of everybody regardless of anybody's political identity. In our free church tradition, imagine if you can 
turning a church business meeting into a precinct convention aimed at settling on a congregation's endorsement of a slate of candidates for election. You think we have long business meetings now. <laughs> In that situation, you divide the congregation, maybe not 50-50, but you divide the congregation. And I want you to give me one reason why a church member in that situation, supportive of the losing candidate, should remain as a member of that church. How can you do that when you've seen your pastor get up and tell you that in his or her opinion, it's the will of God to vote against the person you support? Second, for a religious leader to endorse a partisan political campaign as a spiritual leader. Now, be, pay close attention to endorse a partisan political campaign as a spiritual leader is, in my opinion, for that person to misuse or abuse spiritual authority. For any one of us to claim that we know God's choice for the proper politician to fill an elected office and to demand that all under our spiritual authority should vote for that candidate is not only an abuse of our authority, it's an indication of stunning arrogance and a sign of unquestionably bad theology. Third, to repeat what I said earlier, tax-exempt organizations are not allowed to advance partisan political campaigns, and the regulation is as desirable as it is responsible for both religion and government. Look, we, let's be honest. As religious leaders, we have no special expertise and no special word from God on who should be elected county court clerk, attorney general, president of the United States. Fourth, Endorsement from a religious leader gives a politician the credibility of religious endorsement, which on the campaign trail gets translated into a blessing from God. Personally, I am not willing to take a chance on discrediting God's judgment by announcing that I know God's will for an election. Keep in mind, our nation does not have a tradition of the divine right of kings. We've never been of the mindset that God was going to reveal in every instance who ought to be the next president. Besides, we are not electing a pastor-in-chief. We're electing a commander-in-chief. Fifth, Seeking to advance partisan politics specific candidates in a house of worship assigns to politics a level of importance that belongs only to religion generally and to one's faith specifically. The members of government whom I have most respected through the years are those who have told me that supporting certain controversial pieces of legislation is more important than winning an election. That's the kind of candidate you want. To confuse what is ultimate with what is penultimate is to find ourselves lost in a morass of moral relativism and likely too confused to find our way out of that sad situation. Six, in an election year, our responsibility as preaching ministers is to prepare people to make an important decision and to respect their freedom in making that decision. So, seventh, let us speak on political issues as ministers, Ministers who take seriously the 
Apostle Paul's counsel to practice a politics worthy of the gospel. That's that phrase in Philippians. He uses the, the word that we get politics from. Uh, some translations say walk worthy of the gospel. The word's politeusthe. It's, it's the word from politics. Let your politics be worthy of the gospel. But we must speak as ministers informed by the Bible. This is an elaboration on what Susie told us earlier. If we don't have anything more to say that can be said in an opinion editorial in the lo local newspaper, then it's likely best that we shouldn't say anything at all. The issues in this year's elections invite our attention as ministers. Poverty and wealth, work, war and peace, government subsidized religion, immigration, health care, human rights, and on and on and on the list goes. Few of any of these issues are not addressed by the Bible in one way or another. But we must speak on these issues from the perspective that we know best. We speak on economic matters without trying to be economists. We speak on national priorities without trying to be political scientists. Religious leaders and our institutions have always made our best contributions to this nation when we functioned out of our primary identity, which is being churches and pastors. Eight, when speaking about political issues from the perspective of Holy Scriptures, Please draw from the whole of the Bible, not just from those texts which, ripped from their context, appear to agree with your personal perspective on the issue. And as a Christian minister, I would counsel you to stay very close to the teachings of Jesus. Ninth, when speaking on political issues, prepare carefully and speak only out of your expertise. Homework related to this responsibility is laborious and time consuming, but at stake is your credibility. At stake is the reputation of the congregation to which you speak. Regardless of how powerfully you deliver your message, if you don't understand the issue fully, eventually that will be obvious to everybody and you will compromise your authority on non-political subjects as well as on political ones. I had a friend one time who read a press release uh, from the Supreme Court and one of its rulings and announced immediately to the newspaper that on the next Sunday his sermon would be on the death of God. It was a sermon based on that ruling in the Supreme Court. Later, that week, uh, after reading the decision of the Supreme Court, a good thing for him to have done, my friend discovered that the judgment that he made was actually wrong and that the court's decision was meant to protect religious freedom, not to try and swipe at God. And fortunately, the minister apologized to his congregation. Studied preparation could have prevented my friend's spontaneous attempt to be prophetic, and he wasn't prophetic at all. It was just wrong. <laughs> Tenth, in political preaching, deal with issues, values, and principles, but not with personalities. No pulpit is an appropriate place for analyzing a person's politics or passing judgment on a candidate's integrity or an individual's capacity to fill a public office. We are called to pulpits to work on theology, to work on ethics, to work on morality, and to work on freedom. It is not a place for taking an individual apart. Eleventh, refrain from identifying a
particular politician's agenda with the acceptable religious position on social political concerns. Uh, be alert. As this campaign season goes on and on, you're going to hear this done. Now, you're going to hear it done uh, in, in public places. I hope you don't hear it in, from pulpits. Uh, but there is going to be this statement, this man represents everything that Christian Americans need. From my perspective, the greatest damage that has been done by the religious right has been its attempt to redefine authentic faith using a person's position on political issues and votes for political candidates as the criteria for making that decision. As far as I know, the Gospels did not summon us to a specific position on reproductive health issues among women or a certain theory of economics as a prerequisite to being a Christian. I, I actually, if I remember correctly, think the biblical criterion still focuses on believing in and following the way of Jesus as he points us toward God. Twelfth, don't impose guilt on people by telling them that they have failed in meeting the challenge of personal initiatives to, rate, to relate religion to politics. Don't tell them that without also offering them specific ways in which they can meet that responsibility and become involved. In other words, tell people how they can make a difference. Registering voters, supporting informative forums, providing transportation for voters on election day. No Christian sermon ought ever lock anyone into guilt without offering a way out. Thirteenth. This is good. I bet you had not heard this many in a long time. Thirteenth, all encouragement and inspiration aimed at increasing political, people's political involvement should be accompanied by clear statements on how that can be done without violating the constitutional principle of religious freedom and its corollary on the institutional separation of church and state. Let me clear up something and I don't have time to go as far as I'd like to in this and do the rest of what needs to be done. Susie, Susie mentioned the, the, the reading, um, it, was, it was Bishop Neal, wasn't it, that you quoted, who said it is impossible to separate religion and politics. I do agree with that. Within an individual, that's true. And your faith ought to be interacting with your political convictions. They ought to be working together. But institutionally, that's not the case. Institutionally, the church and the state operate more efficiently with more integrity as they are kept apart, as they are independent from each other. And here... All I can tell you is we're in big trouble. And any of the three of us who are speaking uh, today can tell you why if you want to ask that question. Fourteenth, as you stress the importance of political activism and voting in particularly important dimensions of Christian discipleship, please don't assign too much importance to politics. Politics is only politics, an integral component of a democracy which must provide rights and freedoms to everybody. Christians, devotees of other religions, people who identify with no religion at all. If all of us do not have those rights, none of us really has those rights. So it goes for freedom as well. So when we talk about the importance of politics, the most important gift that our democracy has given us 
as religious people is the freedom of religion and the opportunity to vote our conscience politically without the results of that being condemnation by our religion or loss of rights from our government. Preaching on politics is a religious task that like other religious tasks must be made by imperfect people. That means we're going to make mistakes. Some of our sermons, and I'm, I'm really glad the dean pointed this out early on today, some of our sermons will sound politically partisan to some people. Be because the truth is, the politicians have tried to steal all the moral issues to which we need to speak and make them political. We can't let that happen. These were moral issues before they were political issues. And, and we've got to take those back. And as we do that, we will be accused by some people sometimes as being partisan. Be fair. Be fair and consistent in your use of the Bible and examples of its truth. Be certain that any protest against your sermon must take issue more with a sound teaching of the Bible than an elaboration of your personal politics. The discussions, the controversial discussions about political issues and morality ought not be discussions about what is my opinion. It ought to be a discussion about what does the Bible say about this issue. Now I know you can get real pious here and you can manipulate that and you can, you can turn it into a way of self-serving what you want to self-serve. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about be fair. Be fair with the Bible, be fair with the person criticizing you, and be fair with what seems to be in the history of the church, the understanding of that moral issue. Four years ago, in an election year, a presidential election year, I caused a good bit of anxiety in our community. Monroe, Louisiana is not the hotbed of liberalism in this nation. Uh, I caused a good bit of anxiety because of the title of my sermon for the following Sunday that was printed in the newspaper. My title was, Choosing Whom We Serve, My Endorsements, in the 2008 elections. Now, if it doesn't do anything else, it'll get you a crowd. <laughs> Here is, in part, what I said in that sermon. I do have endorsements to make in this election year, and here they are. I endorse a secular government appreciative of religion but protective of people who choose no religion and insistent on obedience to Article 6 of the Constitution that prohibits a religious test for candidates seeking public office. I endorse religious leaders in this nation speaking prophetically regarding the great moral issues that hover before us as challenges the resolutions to which will determine the moral character of our nation. I endorse political activity as a sound expression of responsible spirituality, even as I oppose all tests used to measure the authenticity of a person's spirituality by that person's political loyalty. I endorse religious leaders acting as responsible citizens and making political judgments, but never using their spiritual authority, manipulating their theology, or using the sacred rituals of their tradition to influence people on partisan political decision-making and affiliations. I endorse the right of an electorate to know how a candidate's religion will influence his or her decision-making as a public official, and if elected, how the candidate will use public office to advance a particular religion. I endorse voting as a civil act of sacred importance and a means of expressing religious faith and civic responsibility. 
I endorse candidates for the presidency and vice presidency of the United States, pledging to support and defend the Constitution and promising that if ever they are in a situation in which following the guidance of the Constitution comes into conflict with obeying the dictates of their religious tradition, they either will elevate the authority of the Constitution over the authority of religion, or they will resign the office to which they were elected. Look, winning an election is not worth losing our Constitution or compromising the integrity of our religion. That's way too much to pay for a political campaign. My endorsements during this election year will focus on principles, not people, on biblical convictions, not political candidates. The church is responsible for behaving as a Christian church, not as a partisan political action group of working to get people to vote, not telling people how to vote, and believing that our faith is best expressed and our nation best served when we keep the institutions of religion and government separate and our patriotism finds expression in a dream for this nation that is not narrowed, diverted, or tarnished by partisanship parading under the guise of religion. My prayer is that this election cycle will be filled with honest, hotly debated articulations of competing visions, strategies, and policies for our nation so that regardless of the outcome of the election, regardless of who wins, we will be a better people for having been through the campaign. Let us help that process, and God help us. Thank you. Questions? Dr. Gaddy? Yes, sir. Well, uh, this past January, uh, it was a occasion where I thought something out ahead of time. That's state number one. But, uh, and I can't remember particularly the context of sermon that I was preaching, but in the middle of it, uh, it was right up, it was the Sunday after uh, South Carolina public primary, and Gingrich had won. And I made the comment that Newt Gingrich's comments throughout the South Carolina uh, uh, not, not, uh, campaign, uh, specifically things he said about welfare, were racist in nature. And I was focusing on the issue of race, but I called in by name. Mm -hmm. And so my email was filled, you know, the whole week. And right. I spent literally three weeks responding carefully right. to every email and going to coffee, wishing I'd never said it. Not so much because I, I regretted the comment itself, you know, but just if I, if I hadn't used his name, perhaps it wouldn't have had that kind of response. And I said to one person, who said, well, you're just obviously... Uh, speaking for Obama, and I said, no, I could have been speaking for Romney. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah that's right. You know, my issue was not to say something against the dangers of a potential presidential candidate, or, uh, but, it, but against the, what I thought were kind of living in the deep south, code words for racism. Right. How do you handle something like that? Well, I mean, Roger, I, I uh, for, have to say, I respect your ministry and the sensitivity of your pulpit too much to tell you what you you should do I my hunch is that the feedback would not have been as probably um, as much as it was or as harsh as it was if you hadn't used his name because what what then what you would have been doing would be saying these comments are racist rather than calling him a, a racist. Uh, and I have a, have a sense, now for some people it wouldn't have made any difference, but, um, and, and that does, I, I, and I want you, I want to make a distinction also. Uh, I was asked to do a specific topic, which was preaching. If, if, a, if a member of the congregation 
comes to me and, and raises a question about something I've said in a sermon, I don't mind saying to that person, Here, here's what I heard, here's who said it. Um, it it's not appropriate. In some instances, I can even say, uh, I don't think that's what that person is. I think that person got carried away and said some stuff uh, in, in the heat of the moment that that's not who the person is. But I don't make, I mean, I, I, I've used this principle before, and, um, and some people got real, I mean, you know what happens. Some people got real upset uh, because they said, well, w you wouldn't have criticized Hitler? And I said, probably not as Hitler in the sermon because what Hitler represented was more the problem than Hitler himself. And, and so I'm, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to be defensive about that if there is a pastor who knows what his congregation is like and who thinks it's better uh, if the name is mentioned. I just don't do it. And that's what... I understand. Yeah, I understand. Yes, yes. Okay, who else? Y'all are bound to be tired. Been listening. Yes, sir. I think you kind of alluded to this just a little bit. It seems to me that we're on a political track where the rights of the individual are trumping all other rights. Right. You would make a comment on that. I will. I, 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 uh, There are two things I, that I fear um, most probably in, in this election and two things that I worry most about in, in the work I do in Washington. Um, one of them is, is exactly what the president uh, is, is implying in his um, question, and that is that there is this sense that individual rights uh, trump corporate rights, that the expression of the individual um, is more important than the welfare of the nation. Now, it shouldn't be contradictory. I understand that. But one of the scariest things I've, I've ever heard on television, um, I heard about two years ago on CNN, when uh, one night, one of the commentators whom I respect said, we are rapidly becoming a nation incapable of governing itself. Now think about that. I mean, that is frightening. But that was, the context of that was that, that horrible confrontation that went on in Pennsylvania between uh, a, a meeting of the electorate and a senator of the United States. It went on in some other places as well. And by the way, this is an issue I've talked about in, in the pulpit. Um, there are, in, in Washington, there are in, in government in Washington are some of the best people I've ever known but also some of the worst people I've ever known. That, I mean, that's the way it is. It's a cross-section of the United States. It's what we elect. Um, there are some people there who have so fused political opinions and religious convictions that every statement has become an absolute. And so... What is, the, what is the necessity of democracy, which is honest debate, civil debate, is not happening because the one who says, I've got all the truth, says, I don't need to listen to you. You're not only wrong, you're evil, and I'm not going to pay any attention to you. And if you want to see the results of that, the results of that are a national congress with a 9% trust rating from the American public and legislation gridlocked 
that ought to be passed and being uh, already implemented. So we've got to get past this thing of you've got to listen to me because my opinion is one that you've got to know because if you don't know it, uh, you're not as smart as I am. We've got to get over that. And I think you mentioned that today. The, the, I mean, look at all of the stuff that's been written on values. Family values, work values. All, where's humility? Where, where, where is just a little bitty thought that maybe, sometime, somewhere, as incredible as it is, I might be wrong? Where is that? And, and, and if that's not there, we're not ever going to get back to talking to each other. We're not ever going to listen to each other. I, I, look, I, there are plenty of people that hold public office that I disagree with. Some of them I flat don't like. Some of them I wish had not been in the office. I've never failed to stand up when the president enters the room. I've never stopped respecting whoever holds that office. That office is important in the life of our nation, and if it doesn't have power, whoever's in it, we're in trouble. So, so let's get off our high horses and think we can't even stand when a congressman or a, a member of the Senate comes in and we don't like them. We'll just stay there and act like we don't know they are. That's what's wrong. That is a scary thought. Um, and the second thing is the, the whole religious freedom issue, and, and we're seeing it uh, right now played out on a number of issues that are going to be uh, tremendously important in this uh, election year. And there's, there's no need for me to play games with you about that. Um, the Catholic bishops are trying to redefine religious freedom because of a doctrine in their church. I'm f fearful of that because we've come a long way in Catholic Protestant relations and I don't want us to see us go back to the bitterness and the bigotry that Protestant Christians often showed toward their Catholic brothers and sisters. And it's not it's not an issue that has strong legs in the Catholic constituency, but it, it, it has strong voices in the College of Bishops. And, uh, and if you didn't get it, I'll, I'll give you the one of the lines I used was about that, that we're trying to impose by law what we haven't been able to convince our constituencies of by free choice. Um, I, I, so I'm scared of what's happening to religious freedom. And again, I, I'll just, just be blunt. Um, the, there are no hope, there are no partisan hopes related to religious freedom. The president is as cockeyed on that as any other person running for office in this campaign year. Um, we are dealing with serious issues. We, as a matter of fact, we haven't had a presidential candidate in the last 12 years that really understood religious freedom in a way that we could take a deep breath and say, it's going to be all right. We have to fight that every day. And the there is a, a, an astonishing lack of understanding of this precious gift that our founders gave us. And, and when, when, when Susie says, Baptists know the Bible and can, can use the Bible in policy discussions, she's exactly right. We also know religious freedom, historically. Now, there, there are lot, lots of evidence that some new expressions of Baptist life either have forgotten it or just set it aside. But um, if, if we don't speak up on this, friends, 
we're going to lose the right to speak because there is in this nation, and I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just trying to tell you what I believe, there is in this nation a movement underway to redefine religious freedom so that basically it means our freedom, not anybody else's. And if you're not in the group that says our, you're in trouble. I mean, we are practicing subsidized religion now out of the faith-based office in the White House. I was on the President's commission to make the faith-based office more um, constitutional. And we went with 16 recommendations uh, which still have not found implementation. Um, so if you want to know where we are on the faith-based office, we're at the same place we were right after uh, George W. Bush signed that legislation the first day. And, and I, will, I will never forget, never forget, I hope he doesn't mind me saying it, Roger Painter picking up the phone and calling me the day after that initial meeting between the transition team and George W. Bush in the basement of the First Baptist Church, Austin, in which they solidified an agreement uh, on the faith-based office. And some of our best colleagues uh, suddenly quickly forgot religious freedom and wanted the money. Um, and I remember you saying to me, and I won't call names there, two or three people who said to Robert, I mean, to, uh, said on that occasion, said, you all have just got to, as Baptists, you've got to get over this thing about religious freedom. Folks, we got to get on it, not over it. And you'll have many times in this campaign year to talk about what the proper relationship between religion and government should be, and for goodness sakes, take advantage of it. Dr. Ellis, do you have a closing word for us? Well, it's been good. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. It has been good. We appreciate you coming. Our great appreciation to these who have obviously, from what they've talked about, from you knowing who they are and what they do, have set aside time to make this an important part of what they do. Don't let me suggest that this is not important, but they have many important things to do and they valued this as one of them and we're here. And no small part because of significant relationships, and that's been such a theme today, but also because of the importance of sharing these things and talking about these things and thinking on these things. We don't have many students left by this time of the day. Uh, I sometimes when these things come up and we, we have discussions and various points of view and that it sure is easier to talk about having humility than it is to practice it. Matter of fact, sometimes I've been proud of mine and uh, yeah, exactly, right? But, but you know, I, I remember what I read in, in Peter, honor the king. Honor the king. Then I asked the question, okay, this is an academic institution. When was that written? Who was the king? Not very honorable person. Sit down to the king. Well, what implications does that have? Well, maybe you think on that. Or maybe you ask one of these smart people. Uh, thank you for coming. Those of you who travel, may God give you traveling mercy. Continue to pray for David's father-in-law. We do think he's had a stroke, but it does not appear to have impacted him in terms of paralysis or anything at this point. They're keeping him at least tonight. All right, you hear this report, we thank the Lord that it's not as bad as it might have been, but we pray the Lord's continued watch and care for those who travel to do so. Tomorrow morning, be remembering us and praying for us. Uh, these folks are going to have the opportunity to spend some time with students in, in a breakfast setting, in a classroom setting, then a small student setting. And so we look forward to that continued time together. It has been good to be together. Let me close this with a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, 
We thank you for every good and perfect gift. We thank you for these who've come. We ask your blessings upon their lives. Thank you for all of us who have taken the time to hear. And may you give us wisdom to understand and to apply that which you would lead us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In all that it means, shalom, y'all.